Welcome everybody to Editor's Lounge, which has been going on at Alpha Dogs Editorial for quite some time now. How many years have you been doing? Six. Six years. Yay. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday. Tonight we've got a group of really fabulous editors from a variety of different fields, film, television, reality TV, trailers and promos, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the editorial profession, how everybody got to where they are, what they're um, some of their juicy stories, some of their advice to, to you. First, let me just introduce everybody briefly, and then we will, um, one by one, everybody will talk about their particular area and how they got into it. At the far end is Billy Weber, who is a film editor. Terrence Curran, who is an, ed editor. an editor of a master of all, of all right? <laughs> and then uh, Glenn Morgan, who uh, edits reality TV, and Carol Streit, who edits trailers right now. So, Billy, shall we start off with you? Tell us a little bit about how you got into this field and if that's how, you know, how people would do it today. I don't think you would do it the same as the way I started, just because of the technology. But uh, I started, uh, <clears throat> my first job in the movie business was in the print shop at Universal Studios. Uh, and the part of the print shop I worked in was sort of like an overflow from the mail room. It was called the script department, but what it meant was is we uh, uh, printed and collated scripts and publicity releases for the studio and then delivered them around the lot. And it was, uh, wasn't much different than being a laborer on the lot. And once you had a job at a studio, and this was the case at almost every studio, once you had a job there, you could then move laterally into another department when you, when you showed interest in that department and you went and uh, gave them free work. Uh, they wanted to see if you were serious about working in that department and they wanted you to come on your lunch hour and work there. So uh, I was working in the print shop intending or, uh, or attempting to try to get into their editorial department. And so on my, any free time I had, I would go over to the editorial department. I learned how to hot splice, uh, butt splice, uh, code, film, and I would work there for about uh, maybe an hour a day, at the most an hour a day, and maybe do it twice a week or something like that. And after, and got, uh, <clears throat> got to know the heads of the department, and after about a year, a, a year to a year and a half uh, in the print shop, the editorial department had exhausted all of the members of the union that wanted an apprentice job uh, at the studio. You had to wait until all union members had been approached about work, had either uh, passed on the job or taken the job, and then if they still had openings, they could hire people that were not in the union yet, and that got you into the union. <laughs> and uh, uh, Universal did almost no movies at the time. They only did television. Very, very few uh, feature films, and most of their feature films were done out of the country. Uh, they had a big office in London that they did most of their movies out of. So, but they did more television than any other company in L.A. I got hired into film shipping out of the print shop. Film shipping was a union job. It was an apprentice job, and that's how I got in. I worked there for about nine months to a year. I got promoted into, uh, as an, uh, from that to an assistant editor job on a TV series. I worked on that series, and then every year at the TV season's end, which was at the same point in every TV show and at every studio, and they had their yearly layoffs that lasted two or three months, and then they'd start to slowly bring people back as the pilot season started and then the TV season started up again. And I had reached a position there where I was in good favor with the people that ran the department. So they would, after I finished the TV season, they were, gave me the opportunity to go back down into shipping and not take a layoff. And then as soon as the season started again, I'd be an assistant on another show. It was a very unpleasant place to work. Um, and uh, I, I liked the people I was working around, the other assistants and stuff, but when layoff season came, I said, you know what, I really, I would love to work on movies if it's possible, and I decided to try and write a script with some friends. We wrote two scripts during the layoff that we had. We were off for about six months, 
And then I got a job offer. I got the call from the union to go in for an interview. And uh, I went in and I got the job. And it was a picture called The Candidate with Robert Redford oh, as the wow. star. And Michael Ritchie was the director. And there were two editors on it, a guy named Richard Harris and another editor named Bob Estrin. So I stayed on the movie until they finished the post. So I was on it, I was on it for probably <laughs> five months, maybe six months at the most. And then Bob Estrin had been hired on a non-union, very low budget non-union feature called Badlands mm -hmm. to cut it. And uh, he asked if I wanted to be his assistant, but it was non-union and everything. I said, sure, I just want to keep working. Mm -hmm. And so I became Bob's assistant on that. And it was a very long job. It lasted 15 months to, to do that movie. And Bob left the picture about 10 months into it. He didn't think the picture was working. He wasn't crazy about it. And so he left. I was loving the movie, and, but he didn't like it. And as a matter of fact, he thought it was going to ruin his career. And I took it over. And so I finished it, and then, uh, but I still, oh, I just add one thing. At the time I got in, you had to be in the union for eight years before you could cut a union feature or a TV show. If it was a union job, you had to be in the union eight years. So that meant that I had to wait till 1976 before I could cut a union picture. Uh, I could assist on any union picture, but I couldn't edit one. So I finished Badlands, and then I couldn't go get an editing job, a union editing job, and the guy that was the sound effects supervisor on Badlands was one of the great sound effects editors of Hollywood. His name is Jimmy Nelson. He's still with us, but he's retired. And uh, he hired me to be his assistant. So I worked on The Exorcist with him. I worked on a picture called Freebie and the Bean, uh, another one called uh, I think it was called a bank job. It was with uh, George C. Scott and um, Joanna Cassidy. Uh, uh, we worked on several, a bunch of movies together, uh, me as his assistant. And then um, he decided to take time off, which then affected my work life. So I took time off. And then I got a job shortly after that working as an assistant on a TV series, the original Bob Newhart show, mm. where he's a psychologist. <laughs> so I was an assistant on that with an editor named uh, Pam Blumenthal, a, a guy named Pam Blumenthal, wonderful guy. I had a great time working on that show because it was really, every, people that worked on it were quite funny. It was a very funny show. So from there, I got a job as an assistant on Taxi Driver. And there were three editors on that picture, Marsha Lucas, Tom Rolfe and a guy named Mel Shapiro, all great people. And Marty Scorsese, who was the director, was a great person, great to work with. And right about that time as I finished on Taxi Driver, Terry Malick had gotten a deal to make his next movie. So he called me, are you going to be done? Yes, great, I want you to come to work during pre-production. So I went on to work on that in the pre-production of a movie called Days of Heaven. And the day we started shooting that movie was my eight-year anniversary in the <laughs> union. <laughs> that was the first union picture I cut. And that started my career as an editor. The guy that was head of post-production at Paramount, Paul Hager, uh, asked if I wanted to go to work right away in another movie to help out that was just coming back from shooting in New York. It was a picture called Warriors by a director named Walter Hill. And I was going to be the third editor on that. So then I went from Warriors, when we finished that, I went to work on a small, another small Paramount movie called uh, Jekyll and Hyde Together Again. <laughs> um, it was produced by a guy named Larry Gordon, who had also produced Warriors. That's how I got the job, because Larry knew me. It was directed by Jerry Belson. He used to write The Odd Couple and Love American Style, and he was Gary Marshall's writing partner. So we, I finished that, and then Larry Gordon, the producer, and Walter had started a new movie uh, called 48 Hours, and he needed help on 48 Hours. We had a blast. It was a tremendous fun cutting that movie, and I still, you know, it was still 
everything was a struggle as far as getting work. I was happy to get any kind of work that I got. So I worked on 48 Hours, and then another editor on 48 Hours named Mark Warner said, I know of a picture that's starting up. You would be great for it. You'd get along good with the director, and I'm going to call him and tell him about you, because Mark had been an assistant on the guy's last movie. It was a picture called Iceman, directed by a guy named Fred Skepsy, Australian director. Finished that, and Paramount at that point had three movies they were going to start shooting at this, right around the same time. So one of them was a picture that Robert De Niro and uh, Meryl Streep were starring in together. I really wanted to do this movie. Two great actors, it was terrific. But the director refused to meet me because I hadn't cut enough big movies. Then they had another movie called Beverly Hills Cop. So I went in an interview for that and I got the job right away. <laughs> so now I'll just quickly tell you how my career got started. Now, I cut Beverly... There's 19 pictures left in your life. <laughs> I'm not going to go that far. Okay. I cut Beverly Hills Cop. A month after I finished that, I started cutting Pee-wee's Big Adventure for Tim Burton, his first movie. Everybody told me it was a huge mistake to cut a Pee-wee Herman movie. <laughs> and I told them, you know, I met this director. I really liked him. So I'm going to do it. So I did it. And then the day I finished Pee-wee's Big Adventure was on a Friday. On Monday, I started Top Gun. I cut those three movies in a row with maybe a month off. Those three movies made my career to this day. So what happened after the, cutting those three movies, every interview I went on after that, the studio execs said, you made those movies successes. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and they said, no. Those directors, Marty Brest, who directed Beverly Hills Cop, had been fired off of the movie before Beverly Hills Cop, War Games. He was fired two weeks into shooting. Tony Scott had made one movie before that, The Hunger, which they hated, and said it was a disaster. That was Top Gun. And Tim had never directed a movie. He had done a half-hour short called Frankenweenie for Disney, Frank <laughs> which was a wonderful short film. They canceled his contract at Disney over that film. <laughs> <laughs> so that just gives you an idea of how good they are at selecting talent. <laughs> <laughs> and it wouldn't, doesn't matter what I said to them as, as far as that... It wasn't me. I didn't make that movie, those movies a success. The audiences made those movies a success. Something clicked into the audience on those three movies. But it wasn't me. They didn't want to hear that. So I've been writing. I've been getting great jobs <laughs> on that. And I've cut some really, really good movies. Mm -hmm. You know, I cut some... I, Days of Heaven was a really good movie. Badlands is a good, really good movie. They didn't care about those movies. Uh, so I'm not saying that you shouldn't cut good movies, because I believe you should, because I think that's what pays off, because that's what gets you work with the directors. Because the directors, the talent, knows the good movies. I don't think the studios have a clue. That was how I got my start. That's a great story. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Terry. <laughs> yeah. Billy, it's a hard act to follow, isn't it? Well, I started uh, cutting on film also, but, you know, the, uh, I, I also did a, a really like no budget um, feature shot on on uh, three quarter inch videotape back then uh, when I was going to school. It was going to be my uh, school project and it turned into a feature. And um, when I went to edit that, you know, I'm, I had to edit it on video and I'm like, wait a minute, I can punch in a number and it goes to it? This is so nice. cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After dealing with trims and trying to keep track of these little, you know, I just, oh, oh, okay. So uh, that kind of got me into the video world and, um, I ended up uh, doing linear online editing, and then uh, when Abbott came out with the first symphony, I'd done some Abbott offline editing and so forth. When they came out with the first symphony, which was their finishing system, you know, it could do uncompressed video on a computer, which was a big deal. Um, somehow all of my experience and skills that just happened to work perfectly right there, and it clicked with me, and uh, I've kind of never looked back since that point in time, I guess. Kept me really busy. What was, the linear linear? Is interesting. what was the linear uh, system you worked on? Hmm? It was the Grass Valley. Grass Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Did you work at facilities in those, or at different post facilities in those years? I actually or? worked at Matchroom Video. I was employee number one at Matchroom Video. Wow. Yeah. 16 years. Wow. Yeah. And then when did you found Alpha Dog Editorial? 2002 uh -huh. was the beginning of Alpha Dogs. Excellent. And, and actually what happened was the uh, ownership changed and uh, I could see that wasn't looking too good. And then the other part was, uh, and as we're talking about how you get into this, you know, to, it, back in those days, because it costs you know half a million to a million dollars to build a linear edit suite, so there was very little access to it, and you had to just like you had to do, you had to do a lot of apprentice work. You know, you started off you know assisting and things like that, which the good part was you got to learn a lot from other people, yeah. which was great. You know, um, the, you know the, the advantage nowadays is, is so the you know the entry is so cheap that anybody can edit. You know, the disadvantage is you, you know most anybody people don't get exactly. well they don't get to you know work under other people and learn from yeah. you know. I mean, what I bring to the picture is experience. I've already you know made all the mistakes that you know everybody else has to still make and learn from. You know, it's like you. Know, it's so, like we, so Terry, what kinds of, over your career so f thus far, what kinds of things have you edited? Have you done like the gamut of stuff? Yeah, I've been across the board, so yeah. So commercials, features, mm. TV, everything. Yeah. And now it's like, uh, I prefer just color correction, just the finishing. <laughs> and, uh, finishing is, to me, you know, there's like two temperaments of, of editors, you know. I, I can be anal technically and be really creative in, in, in color and all that. And, uh, the client always comes in and loves whatever you do in color because you just keep making it looking better and better and better and they go, oh, this is great, you know? The offline editing, on the other hand, you know, the studio executives that he so fondly remembers always have to come and piss on whatever you do. So no matter how good a job you do, and it's like nobody ever sits down to edit and goes, okay, I got a halfway done job, I'll give it to them. No, you do what you think is the best and then they come and piss on Absolutely. it. And I don't have the temperament for that, so. <laughs> I figured out early on, it's like, no, I like coming in and liking whatever I do. <laughs> All, right. All right, well, next up is Glenn Morgan, who uh, is now a reality TV editor, or are you a predator? Post producer. Post producer. Or editor. Okay, post producer. Can I go back for All right, so tell us, how did you get to where you were at today? Uh, first, I want to say, Billy, that eight year thing? Yeah. That's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed radically, you know, it's just not yes. like that anymore. Yeah. But. Um, I moved out here from Tennessee in uh, 1980 and started assistant editing in 1981. And actually the way that the, the big talent I had, or the, the, the special skill I had when I started assisting was I, I knew both film and tape. Because I'd worked in, I'd worked in, both, I hadn't worked in 35, but I worked in 16. And, and on videotape, it was very, very rare in those days. Everybody was totally one or totally the other. And actually, my first job, I was assisting on tape, but the editor had never really worked on tape, so I was kind of teaching her what to do. So, but I mean, it was a great, just a great way to establish a relationship with the editor. And then I, I assisted mostly in commercials and that sort of thing for a couple of years. And then I kind of wanted to get into music videos, and I found out that somebody I slightly knew was doing a music video. This, this was 80, beginning of 84, um, 25 years ago, I guess. And uh, so those videos were just starting to happen, and so I agreed to do this video for this person for 500 bucks. And uh, it was an uh, artist, I thought it was a heavy metal band, an artist nobody heard of called Madonna. <laughs> and so that was borderline. First thing we did was borderline. Oh my God. And so yeah. I sort of rode Madonna's coattails. That was sort of like the top gun of. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I did. I, my, my three were borderline material girl and like a virgin. <laughs> now, those were all cut on film, by the way. And then, then started doing those in tape. And then a couple of people I worked with in videos uh, got a chance to do features. So I did a Corman feature uh, about women's prison. And then of which one? <laughs> Vendetta. Uh huh. <laughs> you know that one. Well, I know lots of people who worked for Corman yeah. then, and, at, at that time period. So. Yeah, yeah. That was sort of the after the, the golden days of Corman. But, but anyway, it's just fun to say you worked on a Corman picture. Mm -hmm. And then and then this main director, Mary Lambert, who I worked with on the Madonna videos, oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, she got a chance to do a feature called Siesta that was, that was the first real feature I did. I did so I did, ended up doing like six or seven features and really liked that. And then early 90s, that was sort of, um, I was sort of doing mid-budget mid features, and I, I, when I say the middle fell out, it sort of went to where everything was like studio movies or really low-budget movies. And so I had sort of a slump, and then I got a call from a friend to go work on this TV show that I'd heard of, and it sounded horrible, but I thought I would, I'd really need to work. So I took a job on The Real World, and basically that 
was like a whole new career, a whole new world and everything. And uh, I really, really liked it from the beginning. And I, I think that what, and this was, there was no, there were no reality TV editors. The first two seasons, they'd gone through a lot of people who didn't work out. They, other kind of TV editors or whatever, and just people who could not get it. And then they had other people who did great. I think the fact that I'd done features was really helpful because I really knew story. I'd done music videos, so I knew the music part of it and the whole kind of MTV style stuff I wasn't afraid of, I guess. So I worked on like 10 seasons of Real World. I started there, you know, doing that seasonally and eventually uh, worked for that company, Buna Murray, full time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I became doing a post producer, which is sort of creative oversight of, of editorial. Five years ago, I left. I got a call from this guy I'd worked for 15 years earlier to produce a motorcycle TV show. So I'd worked for them for a while and had a couple of seasons of the show on Speed Channel. And then that played out about a year ago. So actually then for the first time in 10 years, I had to go back freelance. And then six months ago, I got a call to go back to Buna Murray to post-produce the new season of Project Runway, which is now held up in court. But we'll be on <laughs> sometime. <laughs> Maybe. It's, it's, no, that's too valuable. It's too valuable. We want to ask you about that because yeah, we're yeah. waiting for it to come back. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> what is it that you like about, um, you know, you said reality TV was a perfect fit. What, what do you love about uh, cutting reality TV? It really is an editor's medium because there, there's the good, the good shows have story departments that, that figure out the outline of the story, but it's not scripted. It's, and because there's no director, really, there's no, it's not like, oh, here, you got A, B, and C to do. There's no real expectations except to tell the story, really, to make it work. And um, unlike features and other stuff I'd worked on where I worked really closely with the director and sat with people a lot of times and was really trying to, it's just like, hey, go in there in a room for a month and come out and hopefully you got something good. So it's really, really rewarding in terms of that. I think in terms, like, I mean, every, and schedules used to be like eight weeks for a, for a half hour episode of, of Real World. It's a little bit shorter now. But, but still, you got, you got a lot of time to really go through, do everything. We cut the music, we cut the dialogue, you do everything, you figure it all out. And, but with starting from a, starting from a solid story outline and that, that sort of says, this is the story they want you to tell, and as long as you tell that, as long as you're true to the spirit of that story, then you can sort of do anything you want. So you sort of get this great satisfaction from every episode, not like you get from a feature, but you, you know, the fact that you can, and if it's horrible, it only lasts eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eight, eight months. But it, but it does, it is, that, it is that kind of thing that you feel like you have made a great contribution to, uh, authoring something that's going to be out there and it, it really it really has your your imprint on it. We've always talked about, you know, that like if you gave exactly the same episode to two different editor episode of Real World to two different editors, you get you could end up with two very different episodes. You know, in a way doing a reality thing is a little bit like doing a Corman film that you can do everything, you can sort of everything you throw at it. They love to see it's like give us more. Everything you want to, you know, you want to go and do your own graphics great. You want to get some sound effects, you want to um, think up some other musical way to approach it. Um, I've cut this show also called uh, Road Rules and the Challenge, which is a competition show. And those two, it's like some of those work and some of them don't. And I just kind of figure out ways to make the competition element of it work. It's very different. Like Project Runway is totally different because it's very formatted. There's, there's a lot of stuff you can do within that. And the people who cut that really love it. But, but it is very, you know, you know exactly what's going to go f from the beginning to the end of each episode. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, uh, Carol Strite, who is a uh, trailer editor. Mm -hmm. Tell us your, your twisting long and oh, windy goodness. path to yeah. where you are today. I hate to bring up this train. Um, I came here in 1980 also after graduating school in the Midwest, and I had met through a school connection an editor named Carol Littleton. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we started but, together. Yeah, oh, wonderful cool. woman, wonderful woman. I ended up at a place through another very tenuous connection called Kaleidoscope Films, which is at the time was the preeminent. All these people. Yeah. <laughs> was Kaleidoscope the, did every trailer yeah. for those three movies, I told you. Right, them. right. <laughs> and we were the preeminent trailer house. And uh, a man, a gentleman who I had the great fortune of knowing, Andy Keene, uh, had started that company, come out from New York and started that company, <clears throat> and um, had pretty much brought film advertising into the 20th century. I was very, very fortunate to have come in at a time. It was at its 
Apex. And I met some of the best people in the business working on some of the best films in the business. Uh, again, same thing, started out as a, as a runner, um, which was an education in itself, you know, uh, coming to the big city and trying to figure out, I've got to get these Prince of Star Wars back to Fox and they've got to go now. How the hell do you get to Fox? I don't know. <laughs> you know, just dealing with the freeways and the, you know, you take, don't take little Santa Monica, you know, you got to go. Anyway, and um, uh, I wasn't a very good messenger, however, but um, anyway, that may have helped me later on. Uh, at Kaleidoscope, you know, everybody was union, but you could, you know, you came in as a runner, of course you weren't union. It was a little easier to get in at the time. It took, although in my experience, it took me, and that's a whole other panel about what the union made me do to get into, to get into their very, you know, illustrious um, organization. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, but that's a whole other thing. Anyway, I met, as I said, met, Fantastic people, really good at what they did. And I got to learn from the ground up on a upright moviola. In those days, you know, because everything was on film, the editors that, uh, when I worked for them, you know, we would, uh, they'd select, I'd break down out the selects, and I had to make select logs, and it had key numbers and code numbers. And I learned how to be very, very organized. And, um, and it's very interesting, because in my, in life in general, you know, I tend to be a bit of a slob. And, but at work, I'm very organized. And that, I, I'm very grateful to those people that I met. Um, I still know a lot of them. I work for one gentleman who I've known almost since the day I walked in, into, into town. And then I was thrust out at a very young and tender age into the world of freelancing. And it paid off for me to know these really talented people who, who um, uh, many of whom I was lucky enough to call friends. I was able to go to, and when they had jobs, you know, I, you know, I, I learned how to cut music from a woman named Jan Bronco, who cut a lot of shows. Very, one, she, you know, cut some of the best trailers ever, I think. You know, learned how to cut effects, learned how to, you know, uh, uh, cut dialogue. How, how, you know, very technical things. You know, everything from, you know. Uh, you know, start leader and where it goes, and it's universal leader, or is it the other kind of leader, you know? Universal always had the pop on the three for some reason, I don't know why, but anyway. That's you true. Know, yeah. It made no sense, they were the only studio. Yeah, it was just with the universal. And their, their, their sound heads on every projector at Universal was in a place unlike any right. other studio in the city. Right, it was underneath, right? It was yes. underneath, and it yeah. was like, okay. But you know, it was the, I look back and I, you know, I just got the tail end of the, the Halcyon days. It's changed a lot, but I got from the because of that, I was able to, to get a very good foundation in film, which I would not trade for anything. And I, you know, went to work for a gentleman um, named Chuck Workman, who, mm, who, uh, yeah, which says well, if you know Chuck, says a great deal about me. <laughs> but um, he's a wonderful man. We're still friends. I worked with him for a very long time, doing a lot of documentaries, and I was the grunt. Um, suffice to say, I got a very, I think, very well-rounded um, uh, background. I really value the, the history that, that is involved, not just in my part of the job, but the entire business. These are crafts. These are people that have forgotten more than I'll ever know. You know, I, was, I worked with a woman named Donna Bassett, who was a very, mm -hmm. very well-known negative cutter at uh, Universal, or uh, Technicolor. Um, you know, I, I missed out a little bit in that I wasn't, I didn't have a home long enough to become the A-list editor, but I've also learned that it's about the work. It's not about being famous, and if I wanted to be famous, I picked the wrong job. But, uh, you know, I worked on, I was the second assistant on a film called Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three, <laughs> and, uh, which was great. I really liked it. I'm, you know, I'm a really good assistant and I really enjoyed it. I loved that bond I had with my editor. And back then, you worked with an editor, you know, and I, and I really, um, I really cherished that, that experience because, again, once you got with an editor, you were very close to that editor, you were the barracuda in the room. And I had to do everything. You know, I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to the feature people. I'm talking to, to some, a lot of times, the producers. I'm talking to all my technical people. I loved going to the labs and, you know, uh, uh, doing the finishing part of it. Um, again, these people are very, very smart. They don't put up with a lot of bullshit. And I was a girl. And um, uh, those cranky old guys made me you know, make sure that I had to know what I was talking about. I could not bullshit these guys. <laughs> and I passed. And I'm very proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> I miss those days. I've always been willing pretty much to do anything.
I have kind of found myself for a very long time doing small films. They are difficult in that you're not dealing with massive amounts of an advertising budget or marketing budget where, you know, I can't, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you where, you know, how much I pay for my music, but I make it work. You know, um, I like working where I have, again, I can put my imprint on something and I'm cutting everything. I am responsible for that trailer.